Welcome to Up My Hockey with Jason Padolan, where we deconstruct the NHL journey, discuss what it takes to make it, and have a few laughs along the way. I'm your host, Jason Padolan, a 31st overall draft pick who played 41 NHL games, but thought he was destined for a thousand. Learn from my story and those of my guests. This is a hockey podcast about reaching your potential. Hello there and welcome back to the Up My Hockey Podcast with Jason Padolan. I am Jason Padolan and today we are going to speak with um, an NHL alumnus of 341 games by the name of Josh Green. Uh, Josh Green was the 30th overall pick um, in the 1996 entry draft, which was at the time a second rounder. Today he would be a first rounder and he went to the Los Angeles Kings. Uh, turns out that we were roommates uh, together for a short while uh, when we were playing together for the Lowell Lock Monsters in, um, in uh, Massachusetts. And uh, Josh went on to play for a ton of NHL teams. He played with uh, the Kings, he played with the Islanders, he played with the Oilers uh, in two different stints, played with the Rangers, the Capitals, the Flames, uh, the Canucks, the Ducks. Uh, he was all over the map, uh, had a hard time securing himself as an NHL regular. He was always up and down, but there was always somebody who was going to give him a chance. Uh, he was a battler and he was a gamer. And now he's an assistant coach for the number one ranked team in the CHL, the Winnipeg Ice, at the time of this podcast. Uh, the Ice are absolutely rolling. Uh, Greener's an assistant coach there underneath James Patrick. Um, and that uh, coaching tandem has these boys rolling. So we talk a lot of WHL hockey. We talk a lot about uh, some of the young stars they have on that team. We talk about Peyton Krebs, uh, who's involved in that recent deal um, for Jack Eichel. And uh, we get down to what we think uh, players maybe can can add to their game in this day and age that'll make them recognize. This is a great interview. Greener's uh, got a lot of good things to say. A lot of lessons here for uh, for athletes who who want to either make the WHL or to make that next step to the NHL. Uh, how to do that? What's important? And um, as always, I think there's a there's a lot to pick up here if you're curious about the game, whether you're a parent or whether you're a player. So uh, great to reconnect with Greener. As as it, we touch on it a little bit in the episode here, but. Um, Old hockey buddies, old hockey teammates. It's the easiest people in the world to reconnect with. It's, uh, it's probably been 20 years since I've seen Josh or, or had a conversation with him. And uh, and we just picked up right where we left off. Uh, very easy conversation when you're talking hockey. He's a real good guy. I know he's doing great things for that team there in Winnipeg. So without further ado, I bring you my conversation with Josh Green. Wow, I kind of good tune there, isn't it? That was a great tune. Yeah, Very like so. Love I it. Like that. That's good. Well, I'm sitting here. I'm smiling because I'm sitting in front of, um, God, it was many moons ago, but we were roommates one time in Nashua, New Hampshire for a short time. Um, Josh went on to a much more illustrious career than I, but um, but we were together at one point there with the, with the Lock Monsters. Um, welcome to the show, Mr. Josh Green. Pods, it is a pleasure to be here. We've uh, we've tried to connect earlier a couple of times. It didn't work out, but uh, I'm glad we could make it work here. And I can. Oh no! On. Yeah, yeah, yeah no worries. Today. Awesome. I love trying to accommodate schedules, and I know how crazy the hockey world can be. Um, for sure, in the WHL market this year, with uh, back to a regular season. Um, were you? I, I you were there in the bubble, right? Last year. Yep, I was. Yeah, 24 games in the bubble in uh, Regina, Saskatchewan. Right. With nowhere to go. And that was your that was your first dip in the water for for the WHL, right? From a coaching aspect. Uh, no, I, I coached the year before uh, with the ice as well, so that was that was my second year. Actually, so two years ago, I, I jumped on with the ice uh, as an assistant coach, um, more of an eye in the sky. I would come on the bench for the third period. Um, but I, I mean, I was a coach, but I wasn't on the bench full time. Um, and then that season ended abruptly because of COVID. Uh, the next year, I actually took a position within the same organization um, with the Junior A team as the head coach and GM uh, called the Winnipeg Freeze. Uh, our season got shut down again. And, and then the opportunity come, 
came up again to go into the bubble with uh, with the with the Winnipeg Ice again. So yeah. So second last year was in the bubble was my second year with the Ice. This year my third year. So right, yeah, because with the freeze, that's when I remember a mutual friend of ours, Ryan Ginter, who's one of the head scouts there for the Ice now, um, was filling me in on 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 you doing that, and I actually ended up reading an arg- article on you doing that, and then it was like then you all of a sudden now you're with the Ice again, and I know that yeah. you know things were a little bit dynamic there with with COVID and everything switching things around. So that's that's now in your rearview mirror. That's not uh that's not something you're gonna go into anymore. Um, I like where I'm at right now. I, I love the WHL. Obviously, it's where I got my start. Uh, you as well. Um, I like working with with these kids. It's a it's a great age group. Uh, these are kids that are obviously highly talented and skilled and and really driven. So, um, as a coach, I mean that's all you can really ask for. I love my opportunity with the junior A team. You know, being the head guy, being the GM, and and kind of being in charge of everything. Um, you know, it was a bit of a learning curve for me as well, because I'd never been a head coach before. Um, but it was certainly great for my experience. Um, but I'm, I'm happy to be back here with the ice, um, working with James Patrick, who has been incredible for my development as a coach, just watching him work on a day-to-day basis and, and learning from him and how he, you know, runs practices and, um, addresses the team and runs meetings and, and all those types of things. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, it, it couldn't have worked out better for me. It's obviously in Winnipeg, which is where I live now. So when the team, I was living in Winnipeg, you know, before the team was, it, the team was actually in Cranbrook, um, got word that they were moving here. So right up, right away, I was like, I got to get on with that staff. It's the perfect opportunity for me to, to kind of, you know, get my feet wet in the coaching world. Yeah. And it's a great city. I, I, uh, one year there, I was playing with the Vipers, which I, which I've said on this podcast before. The Detroit Vipers. I, I had been claimed off of waivers, um, whatever that waiver wire draft is, you know, at the end of preseason by mm-hmm. Tampa, and they had their minor, uh, their farm team in Detroit in the old IHL. So I go to Detroit. We're playing out of the uh, the Palace there, and um, you know, as all young guys, you know, it's like, oh, I'm going to get a great start there. Tampa's, you know, kind of a new start. Tampa's terrible, and they were right and. The only problem was we were worse. Like it was the worst hockey team like I've ever been a part of. Like we, it was it was hor- horrific how bad we were, and uh, everyone in that organization almost got taken up like for some games in Tampa. And for some reason, I like I was just like the last man standing on that on that team. Um, anyway, not going to get into there, but it was one of those ones where I, it was the last year of my contract. Who I was on one year, and I'm like, you know what? Like let me get out. So I asked for a trade. And they ended up finding a trade for me in the minors because I knew we weren't going to be in the playoffs and I needed to, you know, I needed to get some traction if I was going to get another NHL deal. Yeah. So they sent me to Winnipeg. Um, Daniel Gano got, I got traded for Daniel Gano down there. And, um, and yeah, off I went to Winnipeg, played for the Moose and what a, I mean, awesome city. Like it was fun. Like we had a good time. We had good players there. Randy Carlisle was there at the time. Yeah. Um, a lot of it surprised me. You know what I mean? I think it's kind of a sleeper city. So I really enjoyed it. I can imagine having a junior team there. The player, you guys must love playing there. For sure. Like, I mean, so the reason I ended up in Winnipeg is because in 04, there was a lockout and I was looking for a place to play. And um, Randy Carlisle was the head coach as well. I think when he, when you played for him, it, it was obviously the IHL. Um, in 04, they, they, um, it was an AHL team, but Randy Carlisle was the head coach. Uh, I had him in Washington when I was there. He was an assistant coach. So that was the connection. But um, I didn't know what to expect coming here. Uh, I knew it was going to be cold and windy. And I was like, oh, man, I I just needed somewhere to play. Um, It turned out to be one of the best decisions I ever made was was to come here. Uh, I met my wife that year. We ended up moving back to Alberta, which is where I'm from, for a couple of years. But then uh, um, she wanted to move back to be closer to her family. And it was easy for me to to come back here because I, you know, obviously knew some people in the hockey world and easier for me to come to Winnipeg than than to force her to, to live in Alberta. Um, right. And we've basically been here ever since. This is this is our home now. This feels like home to me. So uh, great city. I know that our junior kids, uh, uh, they're treated so well here, even with, I mean, there's an American League team here. There's the NHL, but we're well supported. Uh, the kids get every resource that that they need to be successful here with, with our organization. And uh, yeah, I know they love playing here. That's awesome. So with your story there, did you sign an, an AHL deal or was that an NHL deal that year? No, that was an AHL deal, and it was um, it was just a PTO. I think it was a 25-game PTO, because which is all I wanted to sign because I didn't know what was going to happen with the NHL if they were going to uh, settle the, the lockout and, and go back, and I wanted that freedom to be able to go back to the NHL. 
Um, but as it turned out, it was a full year lockout. Uh, after they canceled the season, I, I, I re-upped for the rest of the year and, and we had a great run. We had a great bunch of guys. Um, we made it, I think, to the semifinals that year, but it was just a, an absolute pleasure playing for the Moose and playing in Winnipeg. Right. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, I definitely want to talk about your career, but we talked about the we talked about where you're at right now, so maybe we'll just keep going with that because you guys got a special group there, man, and I don't need to be the one to tell you, but, uh, you know, number one ranked team in the entire CHL right now. Um, I think you're still rocking an undefeated streak if, I, if I'm not – mistake one loss. Uh, got one loss yeah. you got one loss so you lost yeah. one game um cruising along like i mean i it's tough to follow all the leagues all the time but your box score is just blowing my mind because it's like seven one it's like you know it's like it's like you're not even playing against teams that um <laughs> in your league you know it's it's kind of crazy so what is what is that team like to be around and um and what have you seen from them so far this year it's a it's a really special group this year um this team has come a long ways from from the days in Cranbrook. I would let's say four or five years ago when James took over, um, he really needed to to clean house and change the culture, and and he's done an incredible job with that. Uh, two three years ago, the team moved to Winnipeg, and we just kind of continued on that path, uh, bringing in kids that were high character, obviously really skilled and talented players, but we wanted to bring in good people. Jake Heisinger, Matt Cockle have done an incredible job of building their team that way. And, um, and they've given James the ball to, to run with and, and um, he's done an incredible job. So our team, the reason we're having success this year in particular is because we are just so deep right now. We've, we, we can roll four lines um, top to bottom. And, and I think not a lot of teams in the league can do that. So we're able to create some really good matchups in our favor by just, by just rolling our lines. And obviously we've got some special, um, some young kids that are uh, Connor Geeky and, and Matt Savoy who are, you know, touted to, to go in the first round. Um, we've got a 16 year old named Zach Benson, who's kind of from out your way in British Columbia, who's <clears throat> going to be an incredible, he is an incredible player right now, but um, <clears throat> the sky is the limit for him. So um, top to bottom, we're just uh, really, really deep. And, and like I mentioned before, just a, We've created a really good culture here uh, where our players can be themselves and they can they have the freedom to not to do whatever they want, but, you know, just to be themselves and and uh, nobody's judging them. We've created a really good environment here with regards to that. So uh, great group to be around. Obviously, we're, we're finally having some success. We had a taste of it the last couple of years, but uh, uh, it's really coming to fruition this year. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, even listening to you there, like, I mean, a lot of things were coming through my mind. Like, you know, I've heard amazing things about James uh, Jeep, as he's called, Patrick, as, as a coach, uh, from more from quite a few people. And I mean, to be able to work under him, you've already mentioned that. Uh, but it's crazy, right? I mean, you can be a great coach, but you still need to have good players, you know, and, and you definitely got some good players there, you know, like the, what has been built through the draft, through the lack of success previously, you know, allowed allowed them to get some good players in there. Um, you mentioned uh, you mentioned Connor and you mentioned uh, Matthew Savoy, right? Those were those were the guys I think went one, two. Didn't you get one, the first and second pick that year in, the, in that Bantam draft? Yeah, um, like that's pretty special. You got Lambos there. I mean, there's there's got these guys. I mean, you got some you got some talented players there. And you mentioned um, the good people. You know, like sometimes skill doesn't always mean you're going to be a good good person. Like, did you hit did you hit the jackpot with with these types of draft picks? These are these are good solid kids that are coming in too. Well, I mean, like I mentioned, we just wanted to make sure that we were drafting good, high character people. Obviously, they're they're good players, but Jake Heisinger, uh, you know, fourth round, fifth round, sixth round, he's he hasn't missed on on any of these players, and and that's a large makeup of our team. I, mean, I know we've got our you know Carson Lambos high pick in the Bantam draft, Matt Savoy, Connor Geeky, those types. You know, but we've got Mikey Milne, who's leading the league in scoring, and who was a mid-round draft pick. Gage Alexander was an Anaheim draft pick, was a, you know, a later round draft pick. Jake and Smallwood, you know, so, you know, obviously you need your stars, you need your your high picks to work out for you, but you also have to find those diamonds in the rough, mm -hmm. um, you know, to to for you to have good success in, in a junior program. And and Jake has found those players, and you know Zach Benson, who's a mid first rounder, I believe, but you know, he's he's having an incredible year. He's almost two points a game right now as a 16-year-old. And I don't have to tell you how difficult that is, especially mm -hmm. in, in today's game. So 
Um, really haven't missed on too many players, and that's kind of why we were able to to put the lineup that we were able to on the ice on it. That's impressive. Time. You said something there. Um, you said something there about you know no one judging you, and a lot of the stuff that I do is with players and like working working with them to. Well, how, how do you allow individuals to be their best in a team environment, right? Like there's there's certain there's certain aspects of that, and that's that secret sauce called culture, right? Is like how how do we allow this to happen? And when you're dealing with with players of the such that you're talking about here, we're talking top end guys in the Bantam draft. Two of them, like I've I've seen, you know, that some some players have both of your guys in the top ten in the in the NHL draft this year, right? Like um, amongst surrounded by other high skill players, it's you need to find that recipe to allow them to be the players that they're allowed to be yet still have a structure and have a team identity. That's easier said than done. Uh, I believe, right. Is that, is that kind of what you're alluding to allow these players to, to be themselves, to be creative yet still, um, you know, be allowed to make mistakes along the way too. Yeah. I mean, they can't just go out there and, and play their own game and do whatever they want to do on the ice. Obviously we're, we play, we have a structure, we play a certain system, but we do allow creativity within that within that system and structure. Um, some of our top end skilled guys, they get a little bit more freedom than, than some of our other guys to make those offensive plays. But I mean, they still hear it if they, if they create turnovers at the blue line or, you know, they give up a two on one the other way, but um, more so what I was alluding to is, you know, there's no judging on this team. We, we just allow, I mean, we've got some unique individuals in our team, different types of character. Um, Nobody judges. We just allow, you know, people to have the freedom to to be themselves, and and I think that makes them comfortable within our team. Um, our team is so close; they do everything together. And and honestly, I think that's part of the reason why we had such such success in the bubble is because we were around each other twenty four seven. But they enjoyed it. They they literally enjoyed being around each other and hanging out, you know, all day together. Obviously, you need. A break every once in a while but they enjoyed that time together we had a a room in our in our dorm room where you know we had a foosball table ping pong table and they were always down there hanging out together doing that stuff watching movies whatever it is but they just genuinely enjoy each other's company and that makes us a really tight close-knit team yeah I agree. And any any team I'm sure Greener that you can look back on that you're successful with on the pro level uh there was always that element of like family, you know, oh, like yeah. you were, you were doing stuff together, you know, you were doing stuff together and, and, and there wasn't, there wasn't the disjointed, like the Czechs were with the Czechs and the Russians were with the Russians. And it was just like, you know, everyone was kind of on the same page doing the same thing. Cause then I don't know, there's just, a, there's just a different level. There's a d different dynamic there, right? I, I, you're willing to go to bat. You're willing to sacrifice more. Uh, yeah. I think there's a lot of things that, that can be said for that. And I think it's harder now. I mean, you saying that that's happening with your team right now, I, I, from what I hear, it's harder than ever, just with the way social stuff is, with COVID, with everything, right? Sure. Like to have these guys be around each other is difficult. Yeah, like on our team, no clicks, you know, and then that's, you know, like you said, the checks go with the checks. It, it's not like that on our team where, you know, the 20 year olds hang together. And and I, I should have mentioned this earlier, but our culture change started with Peyton Krebs. When he was drafted to this organization, he set that standard on a day-to-day -day basis with the way he worked, uh, not only, you know, in games, but in practices, the way he worked away from the rink, the way he took care of himself. Um, we would go out for dinner. He sat at a different table every time we were out for dinner as a team just to get to know, you know, different players on the team. And obviously he's probably co more comfortable with, you know, his, his age group or his peers or, you know, whoever he's playing with on his line. But he made it a point to make sure that he sat with, you know, the rookies on the team every once in a while or sat with, you know, players that were from a different country. And honestly, that is translated to uh, the veteran players on our team this year. Now that tradition is, is carried forward. And, and that's kind of what we were trying to create here is, is that type of behavior, that type of attitude. And it, and it honestly started with Peyton Krebs and the way he carried himself. So I, I wanted to make sure that I gave him, gave him some credit too. Oh, good for you. Yeah, I was going to ask you about him and, and, and awesome job that you, I was going to ask, ask you two questions. I'm going to say, what does character look like? Cause you mentioned, you know, you guys want character people and that's such a, um, like when, when I say character, it, it might mean something than when you say it, you know, but yet it's a word that everyone uses. Right. And I think there's different things that, that, that what that means. And I'd like to know what that looks like. And you kind of just said it, I think there, right. Like how you show up, 
you know, what you're doing away from the rink, how you're interacting amongst your peers. Um, and if, if that is different, let me know. But I also want to talk about Peyton Krebs just because obviously he's been a part of a pretty big deal here recently. And, uh, yeah. and, and he's a little bit of an unknown for a lot of people. Yeah. And, and when you talk about character, like for me, that, that is just being a good person, doing the right things, living the right way. Um, we used to have a saying in our gym where I used to train, what are you doing when nobody is looking? You know, you can, you can do all the right things when, when people are looking at you and, you know, you want them to know what you're doing, but when nobody's watching you, are you living the same way? And yeah. I can honestly say that Peyton, he would do that. Peyton, he was, he's probably the most driven athlete that I've ever had the chance to work with or play with. Like he will not be denied. He, I'm actually shocked that he's in the American Hockey League right now. Um, he's an NHL player for me. He, he is, he is so driven that he will not allow himself to, to fail. Um, so, you know, I, I was happy when he got called up uh, playing games in Vegas. Um, I know he was, you know, wanted to be part of that. He was drafted by that team, wanted to, you know, to be a difference maker for that team. But now it's a new challenge for him. And, and uh, he'll get over the, the transition and the move. And, and I honestly think that he'll be such a big part of this Buffalo team moving forward. And, and they'll be successful because they have a player like Peyton on their team. That's such awesome praise. When the players I work with now, uh, when I speak about, you know, that relationship with the coaches and you I mean, you can't, you can't construct it, right? Like you, you got to just do, you got to be you and be you the best that you can be. Um, but the, like the number one campaigner for these guys, it's something that I totally didn't get greener, right? Like totally didn't get like that aspect of like that player coach relationship. I was just like, I'm going to go out and be, play and I'm going to score some goals and do what I can do. And, the rest will take care of itself. You know what I mean? Like, and I, I was almost like the opposite of like, instead of trying to forge a relationship, I was almost like dismissive to it for whatever reason, chip on my shoulder. I have no idea, but like the stupidest thing you could ever do, because guess who's answering the phone all the time? You are right. Or Jeep is or whatever, or guys like me are asking questions. Like, I mean, that word, like those words you just said, he won't be denied. He's an NHL or like, you want to see this guy succeed. Like when you have people in your corner that are rooting for you, that mm -hmm. makes a big difference because it's a hard league to get into, as you know. Oh, definitely. I mean, but for him, it just, for me, it starts with his work ethic and just how he approaches, you know, being a pro on a day-to-day -day basis. And, um, you know, I, I can speak from my own experience where when I got to the NHL, it was like, okay, I'm here. Let's just enjoy it, you know? And it, it didn't last long for me because I had that attitude and, and I wish I could go back and do things differently. And, um, but for, for Peyton, I know that getting to the NHL, it's just a step for him. And now the work begins. Like once you get your foot in the door, now what are you doing to, to take yourself to the next level and keep, to keep taking those steps. And that's something that, that I didn't really do as a player. I wish I would have, but I didn't, I just didn't know at the time that, that how much work it actually took to to get there but to stay there as well and and I think Peyton has has an understanding of that because of his maturity level what do you think is the um I didn't ever I don't want to put a ceiling on anybody because I don't think there really is a ceiling which is kind of what you're talking to and I was sort of got in the same boat when I was a pro is like would I would go to work and like do the work but like wasn't really trying to get better mm-hmm like not actively engaged in improving, right? Like that wasn't really part of the mindset. Like it was like, yeah, I'll take sh extra shots, but it wasn't like, it wasn't dedicated professional intention with like, how can I get better? Yeah. You know, and, and that is definitely something that I didn't do. And guys are starting to get now too, but not everybody still, even still gets that, right? Like you kind of get in the comfort zone there. Well, what I notice with some players is they'll, they'll do extra work, but they'll only work on the things that they're good at already. They won't work on... Um, you know, their skating or their acceleration because it's it's more difficult yeah. to do that stuff as opposed to, well, I've got a really good snapshot. I'm just going to, I'm going to take about 10 pucks here and go bar down for the next, you know, 20 minutes. Right. Um, but yeah. that's, that's not making you better because you, you already have that in, in your arsenal. What other things can I do to, to take my game to another level? Or like for me, when I got to the pro level, I was a scorer in junior, but I, I learned quickly that I wasn't going to be the same type of player at the pro level or at the NHL level. So I had to learn to, you know, play the defensive side of, of the puck all the time or be a good penalty killer or, you know, create energy with being physical or drop in the midst of the odd time. So um, those are hard things to do. And I, and I think a lot of people aren't able to adapt to that. 
and and they get weeded out quickly. But if you can find something that will keep you there, um, if you find a niche, like for some people, it's penalty killing. You know, yeah. some, some people it's, you know, creating energy, like I talked about. But, uh, um, you know, coming to the rink every day to get better and work on things is, is sometimes a hard thing to do. But the players that get to the NHL level, the, the players that have success do those things. Yeah, you got to get your foot in the door for sure, right? And however that's going to be. Um you know, even me, right? I mean, led the AHL in goals one year, but I mean, it doesn't mean that I'm going to get called up and be on the first line power play unit, you know? So like you have to make yourself, you know, valuable, right? You have to be able to impact a game in multiple ways, especially if you want to penetrate into that greatest league in the world and then earn your spot to be there, right? Uh, But back to Peyton, I I didn't actually finish that question. Like, what do you think that, what do you think that the Sabres got there? Like, what do you think is, is like, where do you see him? Let's say in five years, like, I mean, I know he got a ton of points in junior. We've all seen guys get a ton of points in junior. Right. And then maybe not be able to do that. As you just said, do you think he can be a point guy in the NHL? I definitely think he can be. I, I don't know if he will be right away. Um, but because he's such a strong skater and worker and, and real smart, um, he's got real, really good, really good hockey sense. I think he can be successful other ways while he, you know, evolves into a role that, you know, he probably wants, which would be, you know, a power play guy or a top, top point right. getter. Um, but he can kill penalties. Um, he, like I said, he, he's such a strong skater that they can use him in, in a multiple, multiple uh, different types of ways. And um, yeah, like he, he's just, like I said, he won't be denied. And once he gets his foot in the door, I, I, I can almost guarantee you he won't be going back to the minors because He's useful in, in so many different ways, but he's the guy that drives a line when, when whatever line he's on, even when he was playing with, you know, highly skilled players in Vegas, he wanted the puck all the time. And that's just, to me, that's a sign of a, a really good player, a really confident player, which obviously you need at the NHL level. Yeah, for sure. Um, I had the pleasure of interviewing Connor Geeky. Uh, I know his dad from back in Spokane days. So uh, we've kind of stayed in contact throughout. I mean, he is three amazing athletes. Well, I think he's, I think he has a daughter that's an amazing athlete too. And so we've, we've been, we've been in context because I think what he's done there with his boys um, has been crazy. Him and his wife, you know, like whatever, whatever they're doing over there in, in, uh, in Manitoba is working. Um, And what a great kid. Like, what a great kid. Like, I really enjoyed my conversation with him. Like, last year, he was a 16-year-old, and, you know, he definitely had a mature, um, real likability about him, too. You know, like, he just really seemed real authentic. Uh, so I do know Connor a little bit. I've been watching his success there and seeing his draft ranking go up. Uh, can you compare Matthew and Connor for me? I don't know Matthew at all, but I just love how there's, like, this, you know, Connor's 6'4", he's 5'9", one went one, one went two. Um, are they similar? Are they completely different? Like what, what's, what's the deal with those two guys? They're different. They're different type of players for sure. Um, Connor is six foot four, 220 pounds, incredible reach, um, very gifted goal scorer. He loves to have the puck and hang on to it and bring people in and, and make little plays. He's, uh, he's an underrated playmaker. He can obviously put the puck in the net, but uh, um, he makes his line mates better when he's on the ice. Um, he's, I would say he's still kind of growing into his body a little bit. Um, he's a great skater. Don't get me wrong, but there's another level where he can get to, he can get more explosive and yeah. he will, as he gets older, he's 17 years old. And um, he's 220 right now, Greener. Yeah. Yeah. He, he's got, he's big, he's strong. He's got broad shoulders. Like oh. he, he's going to be a horse. In, in That's a NHL. beast, man. That's a yeah. beast at the NHL level. Six, yeah. four, two twenty. What do you think he's going to end up at? Like, is he two thirty at the end of the day? Um, I don't know. I, I, it's hard to say what a good weight for him would be at as long as sometimes you can carry that weight, but it, it doesn't always translate to more explosiveness when you're right. carrying that much weight. So uh, he doesn't have far to go as far as weight to put on. I, I'd say he could probably put on another, you know, five, 10, 15 pounds max. Um, as long as he doesn't lose any of his, you know, mobility and explosiveness, which right. I don't think he will. Um, he's just a kid yeah, though, why I'm saying that, right? I mean, a lot of times you're still filling into your body, you know, yeah, like he, he's a man child is what he is. Like he's, right. he, he is as laid back as there is as well too, like off the ice. Like he's, he almost looks like a, you know, a blonde California kid that he, you know, I know, I know he, he cares and everything, but it looks like he just doesn't have a care in the world. The way yeah. he goes about his business, real laid back, real casual. Um, just a pleasure to be around though. He's a, like you said, he's always got a smile on his face and his teammates love him. Yeah. Um, 
so Matt Savoy is uh, he is explosive. He's got a great shot. Um, he's a little bit smaller than than Connor. Um, I don't know if he's going to get taller, but he's he's big and he's strong. Like he's stocky, real tough to knock off the puck, um, and he can shoot a puck like like nobody I've seen. Um, oh really? They're both centermen, but they they do play a different type of game, which actually I think really helps our team because you know for matchup wise, it's you know we have two different looks um, yeah. for those two lines, but uh, both incredibly gifted players. Um, Great people come from great families, and I we're we're really lucky to have those guys. Do you have to manage that? And I asked Connor the same question because I mean Matt Matt uh, Matt wasn't with you guys last year; he was down in the USHL. Um, but I said I was like, well, next year you guys are both you know highly touted first rounders playing on the same team. There's only one puck, you know. Like how do you how do you how do you anticipate that going? And I mean he like to to your point, I mean he's so low pulse and you know low heart rate. He's like, oh, it's not going to be a problem. We're fine, you know. Like, do you have to manage that at all? Like, do you see anything there with with this season? Um, so we have them on different lines. They're also on different power play units. We have tried them at at times together. Um, they had success, but I think it works better when they're on they're on different units because they they both love to have the puck. They both like to load up, you know, on the power play. Right. Um, I think that they could play together, no question about it. Um, Who would you keep in the middle? I don't know. It's it's tough. I I think I would probably keep Connor in the middle. Um, it's it's good to have a, a big body in, in the middle. Matt can obviously play it, but I think Matt, with his speed and his explosiveness, would also be a good winger. Yeah. Um, when he came and played for us as a 15 year old, we we played him on wing most of the season. He didn't play much at center, uh, mostly because of matchup purposes, and we wanted him to you know to get adjusted to the league and um, and things like that. But uh, yeah, we we definitely could play him together if they're around next year. I'm sure they'll spend time together right. um, when we load up you know, on a five on three or end a game. If, you know, if we need a six on five, they'll obviously be out there together. So um, yeah. they understand that there's only one puck and, you know, if somebody has it, the other guy's trying to get open or if the yeah. other person has it, then you got to work to to find a spot for the other guy to get you the puck. So they're, they're both so smart though, that, that they would be able to adapt. Take a quick break from the episode here to promote the Peak Potential Hockey Project, my four-week mindset program for hockey players who want to take their game to the next level. Uh, mindset is such an easy thing to say that we need, such an easy thing to say, oh yeah, I should work on it, but no one really knows how to work on it, how to change their perspective, uh, what tools they can add to their toolbox to give their game or their practice, their development, the extra edge that it needs. And that's exactly what I do, what, what I did with this program. Uh, I took my experience as a hockey player, uh, my, my 10 years of pro, and, uh, and what I do now as a coach, and I've put everything together into four weeks, and I broke it up into four different topics. One being mental agility, I call it, the ability to be able to reframe situations and perspectives that'll serve you and make you better. Instead of feeling like you're the victim, instead of feeling like things are working against you, I give you tools to be able to meet them head on, to be able to use your mental agility to allow yourself to perform at your best in the biggest moments. Uh, week two is 10x development. This is a way to craft your improvement, your development as a player with professionalism, with intention and with focus. Uh, it's goal setting 2.0, I call it in a way that you've never heard it before. Week three is growth mindset for hockey players. Uh, this is something that held me up quite a bit as a hockey player, not understanding that there's always room to grow, there's always room to improve, uh, even how to channel uh, mistakes, how to channel challenges, uh, what they mean to you, how to change the story of what that's all about. That's week three and week four, very important finish is called extreme ownership. Uh, that's where we control the controllable. So many athletes have a hard time understanding what is it within their control. Um, I give you the five biggest ways um, to improve your game and to prove your accountability to your game by understanding what you can control. Um, there's a, there's other great stuff in that week too. Uh, Jam-packed weeks, tons of value. Uh, I've been told it's the best mindset program on the market. Uh, I stand by it. I'm seeing the results players are getting. If it's something you are interested in as an athlete or as a player, check it out, www.myhockey.com. It's the Peak Potential Hockey Project. Now back to my interview with Josh Green. In this day and age with the NHL, a lot of 
I shouldn't say a lot. There's usually one or two or three and sometimes more uh, guys g- graduating to the NHL way earlier than in our day um, because they have to with the scout, with the salary cap, right? I mean, they need these young guys to step in. Um, do you anticipate, like, do you, do you see that that could maybe be an option for one of these guys? Are the NHL ready ma- maybe next year? Um, I wouldn't put it past them. I, I think they could be. If, you know, we'll see how the rest of this year goes and, and what yeah. type of work they, you know, they put in the summer. They're both dedicated. I know they're both big and strong, so they've obviously put in the work in the summer and, you know, they want to be NHLers. I know that that's their goal next year to, to start the year in the NHL. Um, but time will tell. I, I mean, I, don't, I wouldn't put any extra pressure on them just because if for some reason they didn't start the year next year in the NHL, it doesn't mean they're not going to have 15, yeah. 20 year careers. Um, like you said, it, there really isn't a, a huge rush to, to get these young guys in the NHL. You, at times you've seen players rushed along and maybe that wasn't the smartest decision and it ended up hurting them in the long run. I don't know if that would happen to these two. Um, generally teams are, are pretty cautious about that nowadays, making sure that if they do put a, an 18 year old in the lineup, they're, they're ready. They're physically yeah. ready. They're ready to handle that grind, which I yeah. think they, they would be. Um, right. But time will tell on them. I, <laughs> we'd obviously love to have them back next year, but uh, you know, if they're ready for the NHL, then, then yeah. that's great for them. Well, that's the thing with what you do, right? I mean, your job is to develop them and to move them on, you know, like really it's, it's sort of like that double edge. Well, it's not a double edged sword. It's, I mean, you're happy for them because you've, you've been yeah. successful as coaches to prepare them. Right. But then obviously it makes your team a little bit weaker, but you have to just keep going through that, going through that turnstile and getting the next guy up ready to go. Right. Yeah. Um, with uh, with your, you know what, I'm, I'm going to ask you a little bit of it. Maybe it's a hard question. Maybe it's not because you were a part of that hit. And I know that for me, it was a discussion that I had uh, with a few with a few hockey people that I know and meaning when Matthew Savoy was 15 year old. Mm-hmm. And it was just, I think it might have been his first game. Correct me if I'm wrong. It was one of his early games. He was first overall pick and he gets hit like a ton of bricks. And no one did anything on that lineup. Or at least no one did it anything in the moment. Was that something that you thought was okay? Was it something that you guys talked about afterwards? Like, was that, I know the games change and I know like there's a lot of different dynamics to that question, which is why it makes it hard. But like, where was your thoughts on that moment in time on that day when, when he came into that lineup and got blown up? Well, I was, I was sitting up in the press box and it was <clears throat> right in front of me. Um, it was a scary situation because as soon as he got hit, we, we all knew that he was, he was out cold. Um, so my immediate thought was, is he okay? I just wanted to make sure he was okay. Obviously, as time goes by and you see him get up, then you, you know, you get those juices flowing, and and you know, it's only natural you want retribution. Um, in looking back, yeah, I would have loved to seen you know some response there. Um, I don't know if we necessarily had that type of mentality, that type of team to to do that, you know. Cars later in the, I don't know if it was later that game or the next game, Carson Lambos, you know, he got involved and, and it was discussed and we did show some pushback. Um, it is a different game now. I know when, when we played, if that hit were to happen, it was, it would have been a line brawl, 100%. Um, but that's just not the way players think nowadays. And, and, you know, is it the, is it the right thing to do? I, I don't know. It's not for me to say. I know that in my nature, I probably, you know, I'm not a fighter. I'm not, I'm not tough, but I would have, I would have jumped in there and I would have probably tried to do something, whether I could have done anything. I don't, I right. don't know, but that was just my, that was my instinct. And it probably wasn't my instinct growing up, but because I saw it happen so many times, like, okay, this is, this is how I need to act. Right. Right. Things like that happen. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's different now. Um, I will say this, our team, has grown a lot since that incident. And now, you know, if anything were to happen like that again, like we're, we're in there, we're in there like a dirty shirt. Not every, you don't have to fight. We never tell anybody to fight if they don't want to, but at least get in there, you know, go yeah. chin to chin with them and, and don't back down. And, yeah. and yeah. Uh, I think at times in the past, it, it, it has happened and, and we've grown a lot as a team where we don't back down to anybody. Now we're, we're a smaller skilled, quick team, but we can also play physical and, you know, be first to pucks and take a hit and, and not be, not be afraid like that. So um, yeah. it was a scary situation, um, especially because, you know, 15 years old, 
he was early in his, his WHL career. I know there was a lot of talk about should he be playing, should he not be playing. He was fine. Um, physically, he, he could play. He could handle that stuff. It was just a, a situation where he cut to the middle and his head was down and, and yep. he got caught in the train tracks. And, and, and he would be the first to admit that, yeah, I made a mistake. I, I shouldn't have done that. And, and you know, I'm, I'm glad nothing further came of it as far as his health. He's bounced back no problem, and, and you know he's he's grown from it and, and is a better player because of it now. Yeah, and you guys maybe grew from it too, and that's why, I mean, I think everything's a learning opportunity. I mean, he must have learned from it, and probably your group in general learned from it, um, you know, just how you do want to show up, you know, how you guys want to play together and for each other and what type of message that even tells each other, everyone in the room, right, yeah. of like what you're prepared to do or not prepared to do. Um, I just heard an interview on the way over here, Greener, talking about an old compa- compatriot of ours, uh, who went on to the Hall of Fame by the name of Jerome McGinla. Um, Conroy, the, Connor there was talking about him in in, uh, in Calgary. And they were just talking about, you know, the, the the elements that Jerome brought, you know, on a night in and night out. And, you know, obviously how deserving it is for him to be to be in the NHL. But they were trying to find comparables, right? And they're saying in this day and age, um, it's really hard to find somebody like that. You know, a guy that would be punishing in the corners and would be that guy that in a you know game three in a stanley cup final that would like drop the mitts with somebody to get some emotion going and really be that emotional leader um i'm a massive advocate that i think that player can still exist um but i just i also think that it's like for for like for somebody to show that little bit of you know, that little, like that little bit of extra, that little bit of grit, that little bit of that competitive nature. I think that my God, like if I was in, if I was in your chair behind the bench, I'd be loving that guy on my team. Like, do you, do you think there's a place for a guy like that now? Um hundred percent. Yeah. hundred percent there is like there is, he was the ultimate power forward. Like I, I think back when you, when you talk about power forwards, um, you know, John LeClaire, Keith Kachuk, um, you know, guys like that. I remember Lindros. That and Eric Lindros, guys that were physical, um, will drop the gloves if, if need be, but they also have skill and they can, they can score. Um, Jerome was as intense a player as I've ever seen. I've, I got a chance to play with him briefly in Calgary. He was the ultimate leader for the team. Um, the nicest guy, welcoming off the ice, you know, made sure everybody was comfortable soon as that puck dropped for the game, it was, it was game on and, and he was taking no prisoners and whatever he had to do to win the game, whether it was take a hit, whether it was score a big goal, whether it was drop the mitts to change the momentum, uh, he would do it. And I think back to that playoff run that they were on. I actually started the year with Calgary that year and uh, got put on waivers right before the deadline. And then they went on that run. So um, I was, it was hard for me to watch because I was a part of it for, for most of the year. Um, but I also was watching it as a fan, like, man, this is incredible what they're doing. This team who I think they just squeaked into the playoffs and they went on this run and, um, you know, the red mile and all that stuff. You, I mean, everyone remembers that, but Jerome was a big part of that. The biggest part of that for the flames, him and, uh, Kiprasov, I would say, but, um, every playoff round, he, he, he was changing the momentum with, a, with a big fight. And, uh, I remember, I think he fought Darian Hatcher one round. Yeah. Um, I can't remember who else, but Vinny the Cavalier had the yeah. That was a tilt. The finals. Yeah, um, he there there isn't a player much more deserving to go into the in the Hall of Fame than Jerome McGinley because of the way he was as a person, the way he was as a player, just a, a do it all kind of attitude, and uh, really happy to see him uh, get that uh, get that accolade. Yeah, I know for sure. Uh, like I said, it couldn't be a better ambassador for the game off the ice too. It was always just a great human being. And, and, uh, you know, you're talking about, you guys are looking for good character people, right? I mean, there was a, there's a great example all the way around of what a hockey player can and should look like. And it's amazing because he's born. Well, I think we're essentially the same age. I think maybe he's a 77. I'm a 76. Yeah. Um, but it was like, he's like, he's like the example to me of like what being a Canadian hockey player is. Yeah, hundred percent. You know what I mean? Like, if, if if you think about what it takes, to, I mean, when you put that maple leaf on or what we stand for, it's like it's Jerome McGinley. Like he's skilled, scores goals, will do anything for his team, yeah, contributes to the community. You know, like we'll fight. Like it's just like I don't know. I just think that he's like a great representation of what of what the game can be and 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 could be. You know, yeah. for, a, well, as a whole. I I grew up playing against him a little bit because we are the same age. Um, and then obviously he went to Kamloops. I played the Medicine Hat, so we didn't see a lot of each other in junior. Um, but I do remember one time we went into Kamloops and it was a, 
it was a TSN game. And uh, okay, this is going to be a big measuring stick for our team against Kamloops. They won the Memorial Cup the year before. And it, it was like men against boys. I think they beat us like 7-1 or 8-2 or something like that. And and he was a beast. And their whole team was like Shane Doan was there and Tyson Nash, Jason Str- They had so many good, so many players that actually went on to play in the NHL. And we were like, okay, we are nowhere near where they are as a team. And a lot of it had to do with, with Jerome and, and him leading the charge and being physical. And right from puck drop, you could just see in his eyes that, that he was like, this team is not going to even come close to us. Today. Yeah. No, he and definitely had that eye of the tiger. Do you think, and why, why I brought him up though, is like, cause I'm, I'm around junior hockey now. I'm around these, these amateur athletes, uh, you know, that are, that are chasing the dream. And, and there's no doubt in my mind that the game is faster. The game is more skilled um, than when we played. But I do think that that element, that Jerome intangible element has been removed has been has been also removed i'm not saying like the pendulum swung a ton but i think like with the skill some of that competitive angry grittiness has been has taken away um do you think that's like the opportunity for some of these guys now to be a separator because everyone is so skilled like can that intangible be that grit that is really going to let you stand out and get noticed sure could be i i mean i I think you ask any coach today yes they want skill they want speed they want all the stuff that all the other coaches want but they want gamers. They want guys that compete. And, you know, there's a puck in the corner, two guys going for it. Who's going to come out with that puck? What are you going to do to, to come out with that puck? And um, <clears throat> I think a lot of players now, though, they use their skill. They, they try and use their skill to get it and their edges and all that stuff. I, I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big component of that stuff, but I'm also, you need that, you know, that FU attitude, like, I'm, this is my puck and you're not going to, you're not going to take it from me. And, yeah. Um, not to say that some of the skilled type of players don't have that, but maybe there back in the day, there was a little intimidation factor where you, sometimes you could just look at somebody in the eye and, and you had them beat. You could just tell, I got this guy. And I don't know if you see that nowadays and maybe it'll swing back around in in, you know, 10, 15, 20 years where that grit and that, you know, that feistiness will, will come back and, and be prevalent in the game again but I, I do like where the game is right now i think the game has never been better with you know how good these these young kids are i, I watched my my son's team play he's 11 years old and you know there's a kid on his team that i don't know how he's not going to be a, a star like he, he skates he's sh- like he's 12 years old and he looks like a whl player to me at times you know, and he's still probably, you know, four years away from, from that. But is that the 09 age group you're talking about? Uh, 2010 age group. He, oh, he would, this kid would be an 09 player. But uh, yeah, yeah, it's incredible. Like, I mean, it's different now because you've got so many, so much, so many different tools available to you at nowadays than we did back then. Yeah. You know, different type of coaching, all this different skill stuff. And um, so I think it's, it's helped today's player. And that's why the game is, is where it is now. Yeah. Um, but I do think that there's an element of that, you know, that compete, that grit that, yeah. that I would like to see come back. Yeah, no, the, um, I think the, I, I couldn't agree more with you. I mean, I, especially watching the NHL this year, I was actually like two years ago, maybe three, like massively, honestly disappointed in the NHL, like to watch a regular season game to me was boring because yeah. no one, it was a no, every game was a no hitter. You know, there was nothing happening. The guys weren't even worried about getting hit, like in crazy areas, right? Like in front of the net or along the half wall, like just trying to get the puck out there was like, I went to a game in Vancouver and I, and it was the third period and I finally saw my first hit and I kind of realized that it was the first hit. I said, yeah. Oh my God, that was the first body check I've seen all game. Um, you know, in the playoffs, it would ramp up again and playoffs is usually better, but this year, like we're watching hockey right now is entered to me. It's entered. It's fast. It's quick. It's skilled. Mm-hmm. There's some grit to it. There's yeah. some edginess to it. I think the, I think the NHL game's in a really good spot. So yeah, I mean, I hope that the pendulum keeps swinging back just a little bit, right? And if you can combine those two components, I think, boy, we, we mean, we do have the best sport in the world, but I think it can be, like, fantastic, yeah. you know? Here's what I think about that. I think that, you know, there's 82 games in a season. You're playing, you know, three, four times a week. It's a lot. And to get that emotional level up, you know, every single night is is a tough thing to do, playing that many games. So um, you, you see it come back in the playoffs because the games are – there's so much more meaningful, right? Yeah. But there's not, a, especially early in the season, you know, in the dog days of January, February, maybe these games aren't as meaningful and, you know, guys don't get up quite as much as they would for, 
you know, a, a game one of the playoffs or a game seven or, or something like that. So I'm not saying that they should shorten the season, but I just know how tough it is during an 82 game schedule to, to get up, get to that emotional level every single night. It's a lot for sure. It's a lot. I think this year they're getting the benefit of having the crowds in there. Right. I mean, it's just giving them a little bit of boost because there's, I think they're just so thankful to have them in there. Right. Yeah, you know? Um, yeah. The, uh, as far as, I guess we got a question here. So we are live in my Facebook group, which I told you. So I got a, I got a up my hockey parent group on Facebook. So if any parents out there that aren't involved in it, but are, but are on Facebook, it's a really, I, I'm really proud of the group. It's like 1500 families from all across North America, uh, different, their kids are in different aspects of sports and mm -hmm. just kind of talk about some of these intangibles that I think make a difference. Uh, I mean, with anyone ch chasing their journey, right. And give some support and some advice. So we're live in there and we have a, a question some saying, uh, do you think that some of this grit and tangible missing stuff has to do with the removal of checking and real contact at younger levels? That's a great question. What do you think for that, Greener? Um, I don't know. I, like, I think you can still have that grit and those types of intangibles without, you know, the, the body, the body contact or the body checking or the huge open ice hits. Like, I, I'm just talking about like, you know, bat, puck battles or mm -hmm. battling for position in front of the net. You know, yeah. I, I think at the younger levels, it, and I see this, like I said, with my kids' teams where there's kids out there that are 6'1", 170 pounds, and there's kids out there that are barely five feet and, you know, they're, they're 85 pounds, you know. So I think I like that there's – I like that they've taken hitting out at the younger ages. I just think you, you really run the risk of, of injuries for, for certain players at that age. And, and we're trying to – we want to teach them, you know, how to play the game the right way. Yeah. not going out looking for these big open ice hits. Um, so I think you can still have that grit and that, you know, that type of play without, without the body checking. Um, at some point you certainly have to introduce it because that's, you know, as you get older in age, then hitting right. comes introduced. So um, I would love to see more emphasis put on, um, you know, body contact clinics. Um, obviously you want to teach kids how to make a proper hit, but I think you really need to teach kids how to take a hit because a lot of these kids, they, you know, they, they go into a game where, you know, it's their first game of hitting and they have no idea what they're doing or how to protect themselves or how to, how to not put themselves in a, in a bad position, which is yeah. really, and you know, so we talked about Matt Savoy, same sort of thing. You know, obviously he knew what he was doing, but he put himself in a, in a tough spot and, and took a big hit. So I think if there's more teaching, emphasis put on that at a younger age, I think, you know, kids are going to be better for it. Thanks so much for listening here to the Up My Hockey podcast. Uh, I just want to take this opportunity to let you know uh, the Up My Hockey support. So that's me in support of teams or in support of players uh, has been going great this year. I've had the opportunity of working with the BCHL, the first place BH, BCHL Salmon Arm Silverbacks. Uh, I'm also working with other uh, amateur teams, minor hockey teams, and, and also individual players. Uh, it's been it's been an awesome season so far. Uh, lots of fun, getting a lot lots of players great results. Uh, one of the ways you can work with me uh, is is in the team environment. If you're a coach there listening, or an association or somebody, a uh, manager of a team that thinks, you know what, we'd like to do something a little different this year with our team. We want to do some team building um, that is unlike anything else. And that's what I do. I bring mindset to the table. I bring character to the table. Uh, I talk about goal setting in different ways than, than most people do. Uh, and it really gets great results. It changes the culture of the team. Uh, really gives you that extra competitive advantage that, that you'd like to have. And it also gives your players an advantage just as being human beings moving forward in whatever space that they, uh, they operate in, whether it's school or whether it's a future job or whatever that case may be. So that's one way. The other way is the Peak Potential Project, which is uh, – my my signature course now uh, players are going through it and getting amazing results it's something that i release every six weeks um it's a four-week program that has uh, daily content monday to friday it's only 20 minutes of daily content uh with some challenges assigned to that it includes a coaching call with me each week uh and players like i said are, are just getting rave reviews about the course parents are loving it tons of value so uh that's a couple of ways you can work with the uh with the up my hockey support system that's going on there uh i guess that's uh that's all i got is www.upmyhockey.com uh, is where you can find that 
uh, all the information. You, you can reach out to me directly there. I'm also on Instagram uh, at Jason Padolan, where you can see a lot of my content for free. There is also the Up My Hockey Parent group on Facebook. This is a private group with now over 1,500 families from across North America. Um, tons of great content there, good support, a great community. Uh, we like to celebrate the success of our athletes and talk about some of the challenges and a uh, very positive and informative group. So lots of ways to follow me and what I'm doing and lots of ways to work with me. Now let's get back to the podcast with Josh Green. Yeah, it's interesting you say that. Like I, I did a hitting clinic this year um, in the summer and that was what I spent all my pretty much the entire clinic for a week was on like how to receive the content, you know, mm -hmm. because well, one, they don't know how giving a hit is different than receiving one. Um, and all players need to learn how to receive a hit. You don't necessarily have to be a physical player, especially in today's day and age. Right. But you do need to know how to put your body in position to be able to absorb contact or to, or to feel it. One of the things that I've noticed greener, cause I, my kids, I have three boys, one's 12, one's 11, one's eight. Right. So I've seen them now go through, the social environment structure of like what it means to be a kid these days and you know, how they interact with each other and what the, what they're allowed to do at school and not allowed to do at school. Sounds like you have a boy the exact same age. There's like physical contact, especially now, even through COVID it's like, so not acceptable that they're not athletic when it comes to that. Like they don't wrestle. Yeah. They don't play tackle football. I mean, all these all these body awareness type scenarios that you and I were growing up with, with cuts on our knees and our elbows and stuff like we instinctively knew how to go into hitting much quicker, I think. Right. Yeah. Than these kids, because like right now there there's this they don't do it. Right. So now all of a sudden they're in this this game called hockey, which is physical and can be. And you have these big players who are, you know, now second year ban them. You have these first year ban them that haven't even been through puberty yet. Now they're trying to like navigate hockey at like full ice contact and they've never even wrestled really before it's like it doesn't work out very well sometimes well i say this all the time i i see a lot of uh, parents who have kids that are one sport athletes where they're just it's hockey 12 months of the year and that's it and i just think there's such an advantage to having your kids play a multitude of sports because you know for instance baseball can help with hand eye um, soccer, your footwork, you know, lacrosse obviously helps with hockey as well. So I think the more sports that you can expose your kids to, um, the better off they're going to be as athletes, Not maybe not just hockey players, but as athletes. And all of the stuff translates towards hockey. So if your kid is playing, you know, if he's playing 12 months of hockey a year, I just don't think there's there's a lot of benefit to that. He needs to have an off switch for hockey and do other things that, will rekindle his fire for when hockey season comes around again. I grew up playing, I played fastball when I was growing up uh, in Alberta and I played soccer and, you know, I played golf, you know, so I, I just think that number one, it'll, all these other sports will help you in your hockey, but it also, um, it gets your mind off hockey for a few months of the year where, you know, now when the weather gets cold again, now you're like, oh yeah, it's hockey season again. And then you get that fire burning again. As opposed to, I think some of these kids get burnt out, you know, playing, playing so much hockey and, and yeah. you see a lot of them leave the sport and they're stopped playing when they're, you know, 14, 15, 16 years old, which is where they should be, you know, taking off. Yeah. Ramping it up. I agree with you. I mean, I'm definitely, I mean, if you had to ask me where my line is, I mean, I'm that, I mean, at some, at some point, and I think it's earlier than when we played, like you do need to commit just because that's the way it goes. You got to pick your sport. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think like, 12 and under 13 and under um like yeah i mean one it makes you i think it makes you a better athlete like you said which i think correlates to being a better hockey player i think it gets you better uh re ready mentally i think all these other sports like the nuances of other sports whether it be basketball hockey i mean uh, basketball soccer football like the there's relational aspects that apply to your sport right and and the more the deeper your nuance uh, like your understanding your knowledge of that is i think it i think it applies big time um which brings me to the next question actually um which is another thing that i see and and, and obviously don't agree with me if if you don't but i think the what i would call hockey iq isn't i don't think it matches like the development and the skill aspect um I have a few theories on that for me say, saying that, but do you, do you see that? Do you see these guys coming in and like maybe not quite understanding the game as much as you would like like them to do? Um, 
a little bit. I, I see like hockey sense is huge for us. We we want our players to have to have that hockey sense. Um, so I, I think a lot of kids nowadays are so focused on the skill aspect of it. Like, um, you know, can I take a puck and, you know, flip it up and go under the bar, all that type of stuff. Um, <clears throat> I, what I love most, like, don't get me wrong. I love all that stuff. I think it can help you as a player. I love small area games. I love where you have to use your brain and think. And you have to be adaptable and creative and, and, and those types of things. I learned hockey growing up on an outdoor rink where it was just an open sheet and a puck and a couple nets and some buddies. And we would just play shinny. And that's where I kind of learned, you know, a lot of different skill stuff. And, you know, I would just experiment with things out on the outdoor rink. And But now it's just it's so specific to. Yeah, if you're going to play junior, you need to be able to go under the stick and under the bar and, and all that. You know, I. Sure, that stuff helps, but I think that hockey sense and compete and, you know, that adaptability part of, of the game is, is just so important. You need the skill, you need the skating, no question about it. But if you, if you don't have hockey sense then, and, and you have all the skills, then you're not going to go very far. That's, that's just right. kind of, we're seeing that. Like, we see kids that have all the skill in the world, but they don't know how to play the game the right way. And in a team sport, in a team aspect, it's, it's tough to be successful that way. Well, that's what I'm talking about. I mean, I, I think in you, in my, in, I have my own couple theories. One is what you just said. These kids, these kids play hockey all the time and it's always some type of structure to it. There's someone on the ice with a whistle telling them what to do and where to do it. Mm -hmm. There's so much emphasis on like going around the pylons and doing this and doing that, right? Like the skill development stuff. So like there's there's not much creativity, not much reading and reacting. You know, obviously different coaches are different at, but I'm just saying in general, like the general philosophy and direction of hockey has gone that way where there's very little freedom to go, just go and play, right? That's where you learn how to give and go. And that's where you learn. You're talking about the small area games. I love them too, right? As a coach now, I love getting into that because you you have to work, right? You have to figure out how to manipulate situations to your advantage, right? Like what works, what doesn't. Um, allow the kids to play it out. So I don't think there's enough of that just in general from a young age. And the other thing is, I think the way that these kids are participating with the sport, meaning like their generation, what do they watch on TV greener? It's highlights. Yep. All the time, right? We, we, were, we didn't have that luxury. We'd have to sit and watch a hockey game. You tell me there's very few kids that'll watch a hockey game front to back. They might watch the highlights in the morning or the five minute thing, but they're not getting like, what does the four check look like? Like, how do these guys defend in their own end? Like what, like all that stuff is kind of like yeah. not part of it. Right. And I think that without the creativity, without the open ice experimentation, without actually watching the game as a student, you become a skilled athlete that really doesn't understand their game very well. Yeah. I, I love um, sitting down and watching a game and with my son, I try and get him to sit and, and watch it with me and I'll just point stuff out. Yeah, you know, like away from the puck. Look what he's doing away from the puck. Look where his positioning is. My son's a defenseman, so I'm always telling him, watch what the D are doing here. They're they're always on the right side of the puck. They're not, you know, they're not cheating for offense because what happens if, if it doesn't work out, then you're giving a two on one rush the other way. So um he'll sit and watch for you know five, ten minutes, half a period, maybe, and then he'll get bored and he'll you're right, he'll go watch highlights or he'll go yeah. watch uh, you know, goals of the week or something like that. Yeah. But um what's great. And, and maybe this will, I might sound like a crazy hockey parent here, but one of the parents on his team will put my son's game on YouTube and I'm able to just watch it with my son and, and just like, I can stop it and rewind it here. Like, okay, what were you thinking here? Like all this stuff. Um, I'm also watching his reaction to see like, is he, is he getting bored? Is he paying attention? Because if he's not into it, then I, then I would just stop it. But he loves it. He loves like kids are so visual these days. They, they want to see, they want to see themselves on camera. Yeah. But they also want to see, okay, I did this play there. This is why it didn't work out. Um, so, so that part of it is really fun for me. That's, that's the coach in me that sits down with him and tries to, to go yeah. through stuff with him. And I understand, I'm sure there's people out there thinking that, you know, you're nuts for doing that, but I do think it helps them. Um, but I, I don't do it every game. And I, if he wants to do it, then I'll do it with him. If he says, no, dad, I, I don't, I don't, I don't need to see it today. Then no problem. Yeah. No, for sure. But I think, I mean, it, it sounds like you, you mean you're, I think those are the two biggest ones. I think like, I think that's where, like where the game, 
could grow or as far as like what this program is all about is like how how to go to the next level or how to take your game to the next level is like be a student of it you know like just don't look at the highlights and the flash and the goals right like understand how that goal happened right and it's not we love the Connor mcdavid going through four guys and under the stick and beat the you know like we love watching that of course that's entertaining yeah. and our and our and our youth though are so attached to watching that like that's what they're trying to do but there's so many things as you know that's ha- like all the things you're talking about away from the puck what's happening away from the puck what's happening yeah. what's happening around the puck and um and and for me like when i'm watching even in like the junior practices that i'm been going to and some like it's just like some of these guys just don't get it you know like they're not quite getting it yet so i think that there is some room for growth and i would imagine in your position that is one of the things that you guys are doing now is kind of maybe teaching the game in a little bit different ways than uh than maybe we were taught it or had to be taught it back when we were going through it yeah and and i will say this about some of our players not all of our players but a lot of these guys were the best player on their team all through their lives and they had the freedom to do whatever they wanted out there because they were so much better than everybody um they and you know whatever stakes mistakes they made they you know they were quick enough to, to get back and, and recover or they would outscore their mistakes you know yeah. they, maybe they would cause two or three against but they would score five yeah um but now the challenge for for some of these guys at this level is we need them to they're going to get their chances every single game but can they do it within our within our structure where they're not giving up chances the other way you know because as a as a coach that's what we want to see. Like we we want to see not many chances against. We want to see obviously play in the offensive zone, but we don't want to we, we don't want to be run and gun because that's that's why I don't have a lot of hair left. And when, <laughs> you know when our players play high risk and things like that. But uh, um, so yeah, it's it's a work in progress for for some of our players, for junior players in general. To now you got to play within a structure type of system, which they're probably not used to. To playing that way at you know in phantom and, and midget yeah. and even before that so it's it's a challenge it's um it's a daily thing where you know we do we do five on five system stuff every single day and james is really good about this if he sees something he doesn't like he stops it he corrects it he'll look at you know the person that that needs to fix their mistake he'll look at him right in the eye and do you understand what i'm saying yep okay let's do it again so it you know they understand that we're trying to get them to play a certain way and they understand if they're not doing it and, yeah. and eventually, eventually they get it, but it, sometimes it does take a while. Well, good on you though. I mean, cause that's the other thing we already talked about, like how to get your foot in the door in the NHL. Like if you don't know what the defensive side of the puck means, or if you don't know how to defend, yeah. right. You're not going to stick around very long because there's very few guys who can step in and be offensive producers instantly. Right. So like you got to understand how to do that. And that's that would probably be a, a scenario in the WHL that would maybe be challenging. Right. Because like you said, these guys are all they've been the best and they have been the best. And now maybe even they are still the best. And they think that might always be that way. But that mm-hmm. funnel gets real tight real soon. Yeah. But we, yeah. We, we try and get them to play the right way now, because when they make the jump to the pro game or the NHL game, they have to play that way, too. The best players in the world, they they play a system. So, yeah. You know, Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl and those types of guys, they get a little bit more freedom. But, you know, I watch a guy like Patrice Bergeron, who's an incredible player. He does all the little things right all the time. And he's one of the best in the world. Yeah. Um, so that's, you know, we show video of, of NHL games all the time. Look at look at how they play. Look at how hard they work. Look at where their positioning is. That's what you need to get to. And it's it's hard for these kids because, you know, they're young and they're still learning and they haven't been taught some of this stuff um so it's a work in progress and they they don't always get it right away sometimes it takes a year sometimes it takes a couple of years but we just keep hammering at home hammering at home and eventually right. if they want to get to the next level then they'll start to absorb that information and translate it to their game and sometimes it takes a whole career greener and we still don't get it right i mean exactly. like you and i <laughs> we become coaches yeah. <laughs> um First of all, congratulations on your 340. If it's actually funny looking up, you, I was 31st overall. You were 30th. Yeah. Uh, you you played 341. I played 41. <laughs> <laughs> so you got me by 300 there. Um, but what like from your? I wanted to spend more time. We end up talking about what you're doing right now, which is which I I, I hope you I hope you can uh, forgive me for that because uh, I didn't want to discount your your own career. But in, in your in your travels. Um, we were relatable in the fact that we were both it seems like suitcases too, right? We were up and down quite a bit. We were trying to find our, our spot. Um, 
where did you have the most success and, and what was your fondest experience from your time up there in the NHL? Um, I probably had the most fun, the most success when I started here in, in Winnipeg with the Moose. Um, I ended up getting, a, a after that locker year that I spoke about earlier, I ended up getting a one-way deal with Vancouver the next year. Um, played the whole year in Vancouver. Up to that point, I had kind of been an up-and-down guy, always on a two-way contract. But that was kind of the first year where I felt like I solidified solidified myself on the team, found a role. Um, I loved Vancouver. I loved playing there. We had an amazing team, great bunch of guys. We had some success in the playoffs. won a couple of rounds. Um, so I, I would have to say, you know, my fondest memories were probably in the Vancouver organization, you know, split between Manitoba, the Moose and, and the, and the Canucks. I also, I can't speak about, you know, fondest memories in the NHL without talking about the Oilers because I grew up in, in Camrose about an hour outside of Edmonton. So for me to, um, to get traded to basically my hometown team that I, that I watched growing up through the glory days in, in the eighties, uh, win all those Stanley Cups for, to, for me to actually join that team and be on that ice surface that all the greats, you know, lifted that Stanley Cup on was, it, I can't even really put it into words, to be honest with you, how exhilarating that was to suit up for my first game with the Oilers and have a bunch of people watching. And um, it, it was a tad overwhelming, my time in Edmonton, but uh, it, it was very cool to kind of live out my childhood dream in Edmonton. That's awesome, man, because that was at the tail end of your career there too, right? I had two different stints in Edmonton. I had one early. Um, I was probably 22, 23. Oh, and, then okay. I, and then I went to Europe, a bunch of different stops in the minors, and I ended up signing in Oklahoma City, um, which was Edmonton's farm team, and, and got called up for a few games again. Um, right, so I actually, right. Yeah, I see that down in your hockey DB there. Yeah, 10, 10 goals that one year. That was that was good. Yeah. Um, I, went, I went five years almost to the day between um, my second last NHL goal and my last NHL goal which was oh, crazy to think about. That's cool. Yeah. Um, we'll wrap with one uh, that I always like to ask. Like, so in all your travels and all the teams you were on, who is the most consummate professional? The guy that you just, I mean, we, you can't, you say Jerome again, now though, you have to say somebody else that just sort of exemplified what it meant to be an NHL or um, on the ice, like with skill uh, off the ice with, with, with how they went about their business and just somebody you think would be a, a great role model for some of these younger guys now. Oh boy. I, I played with, I mean, you, you mentioned all my different stops. I, I played with so many different players. Um, to, to pick just one would be hard. I, I would like to, to pick a guy that I played with in the minors. His name was Brian Helmer, who was, uh, he was an incredible teammate. Um, he won Calder Cups. We didn't win one together, but we were close uh, the one year in Oklahoma City. He was just the ultimate team guy, would do anything. He would. I mean, he wasn't a fighter, but he would do it if he had to. Um, he was he was so what's real what was really important to him was that the team was a family. And uh and he's he set that culture there in Oklahoma City. He was at first at the rink in the morning, last to leave, um, always working on stuff. Even when he was, I think at the time he was in his mid-30s, mid to late 30s, he was always working on stuff, um, taking care of himself, and just just an incredible, incredible teammate. Um, I wish I would have spent more time with him, um, in, you know, on his team. But uh, he he certainly lasted, last uh, made a lasting impression on me and in, in our time together. So, um, but uh, you know, I played with a guy in Edmonton. His name was Mike Greer, who was much the same at the NHL level. Incredible teammate. Uh, Rem Murray was was unbelievable. And and these aren't like they're not household names, but they're just guys that really made an impression on me just by the way they carried themselves and. and and the way that they worked uh, over right. the course of their career. So I love that. I no, was to play with some of the players I played with. Uh, when you're talking about Helmer, I played against Helmer, uh, and I also played against this guy that I'm going to talk about, uh, Jared Smith, and I asked a similar question, right? So Jared Smith went on 700 NHL games, you know, um, played with a lot of superstars, and not to discount the superstars that he played with, but uh, he said the guy that made the biggest impact on his, on him and on his career was Dane Jackson. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, and you know him and anyone who's ever been around him, captain for pretty much every team he played in and just did everything right, you know, and uh, there's just so much power in that C word called character, right? And like when you when you see it and you're around it, you feel it 
and and it's such a blessing to a team to have somebody like that because everyone that's a part of that like imp- it impacted Jared Smith and to the point that you know it changed who he was yeah like he now knew how he could how he could be right like he now knew what the example was and how he could model that and um and yeah he just said you know and I had the pleasure of playing that clip I played the clip Jared Smith and talking about Dane Jackson for Dane Jackson because I interviewed him because he's okay. at UND there and it you I mean it, it it choked him up you know and it's yeah. uh I just love hockey for that. I love the fact that it's a team. I love the, how how the different ages can impact the younger ages, and uh, and you know you get that right mix in there, boy. You can make a, an impression, you know, and an awesome job by Helms for for making that impression on you. And I'm sure it made you a a, a better veteran, a better leader for other players once you once you saw what that looked like. Yeah, absolutely. And it's it's so that's what's great about hockey and and the game is that. You know, I I played with so many different players, and I lost touch with so many of them. But when you do reconnect with with whoever it might be, you just you the old times just come racing back again, and that's yeah. what's great about you know the people that are involved in hockey. And I know hockey has has gotten a bad rap the last you know few weeks or whatever it has, but ninety nine point nine percent of the people in the hockey world are incredible people, and. Um, I just I just wanted to get that out there as well. Oh yeah, I know for sure. I couldn't agree more. I mean, you and I, what we're doing right now is a perfect example. Like really, I mean, yeah. I don't know last time we played against each other or talked, but it's you know, I mean, it's like we've we have we have been in the dressing room since yesterday. You know, like it's yeah. it's it, it's easy. I, the hockey people are usually easy. Usually, we we get along uh, real real well. Same intention, especially people who are still involved in the game. I mean, like you and I are love the sport, want to be a part of it, and at the point now where we want to give back to it. Yeah. Um, and I know that today's conversation has definitely helped somebody out there. Um, that's why I love doing these, you know, you can, you, your, your insight and, and, and our discussion is making some, some family understand the game a little bit better right now, or some player has have a new perspective that might want to be able to apply to their game. And, um, you and I both, right. I mean, I, we don't want to have anything left on the table and, yeah, well, uh, I mean, and well, that, that's why I coach. I mean, I, I, I yeah. want to make an, I want to, you know, get players to the next level and, and develop them and all that stuff. But I also want to impact them you know, on a personal level in their life. And because not everybody's going to go play pro or, or, you know, make it to the NHL. I want to make sure that I leave a lasting impression on, on these kids. So if they don't go on in the hockey world, then, you know, they're a good human being in whatever avenue they decide to go in, in, in life in general. Yeah. So that's, oh, that's, good that's on important you. to me. And the secret sauce, I think, would you just hit on there is like, <clears throat> that that that's like coaching 2.0 right now is like you getting the person understanding the person developing the person makes better hockey players yeah right so you you develop connection a human connection which which was very rare when we were playing right it was like you know we were part of a system and it was a one down approach but like i i know talking to coaches now that are involved like the better you are at that human connection that that yeah. human piece you're going to get a better hockey player and it yeah, just you'll, makes sense. you'll just get through to the player quicker if you if you know them on a personal level, if you, if you actually invest some time with them and get to know them and, you know, ask about their family or ask about, you know, what, what are their interests outside of hockey? So you have that connection, you know, away from the rink as well. So when you try and, you know, teach them something, you know, within the game of hockey, then you have their attention and and they trust you, which is, which is a big word. You know, they have to be able to, to trust what you're saying. And, you know, part of that is just making those, personal connections with those players exactly i always had a great comment there from somebody saying i love that there are people like you guys out there with a with the heart and a hockey stick so um thank you for that um yeah you I mean i know greener's just trying to do the right thing and that's just the what, what what we're trying to do here is just is just help and do the right thing and uh and be a part of this great game uh which has given both of us so much i know um yeah. And now our boys get to play it too. So it's fun to be a part of that. But Greener, thanks so much for your time. I had to run to my younger son's practice. Um, we got to do this again. Uh, I got your number now, so you're not going to be able to get rid of me. Um, lo- lo- love having these chats, though. It's great. I love seeing the success you guys are having. Make sure you give Connor a big hello for me. And I want to keep watching you guys uh, tally up the win column there. Absolutely. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Anytime uh, you want to do it again, I'll I'll be around. So All right. Thanks, buddy. Thanks, Cheers. All right, thanks for sticking with us here today. Uh, Greener, if you're listening, thank you so much. That was an awesome conversation. If you're listening here to the end, thank you listeners for staying till the end. Uh, I really wanted to get into Greener's career uh, because his career is like a lot of careers out there 
One, well, not a lot, because not a lot of people play 341 games in the NHL. So that's impressive to say the least. But not everybody plays 341 games in one city or has a has a career like Zdeno Chara, you know, that everyone knows about. Greener was a journeyman. Greener was somebody who battled for every game that he got. Uh, he was somebody who kept finding ways to get opportunities with new teams. Um, and pro hockey's a grind. So I really wanted to chat with him about his journey about him signing in all these different places, playing in all these different places, probably not having uh, houses in these places, but living out of hotels and being up and down to the miners, um, and what that experience was like for him, and what he wished he could have done differently. Some things that he could have, uh, you know, he could have shared with us about that experience. I know there have been a ton of great stories there. Uh, so maybe we'll have him back on and spend more time talking about Greener and, and what he took away from, from all his time in pro hockey. But today we talked about the Winnipeg Ice. They deserve that recognition. Those players on that team deserve that recognition. They are the number one ranked team in the CHL. Greener works with them every day trying to get those guys better. Uh, and it's a pretty cool feather in your cap to be a part of uh, the best team in the Canadian Hockey League uh, as we speak. So Greener, thanks so much for taking time today. Thanks so much for sharing your time with me, listeners. Um, I'm going to try and be a little more frequent and a little more automatic here with the podcast, but I've been working with these other teams and getting so busy um, on the support aspect that it's uh, it's hard to get these things lined up and arranged. As you can imagine, there's quite a bit of work involved in them. But uh, definitely have a good potential lineup coming out here. So stay tuned to the podcast. And uh, until next time, play hard and keep your head up.